Um, we're also getting to, I think, one of my very favorite portions of Scripture, which is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And we always open our service with Scripture reading, but today I want to do something that might be a little more uh, friendly and helpful for the young ones, especially uh, my four-year-olds who are in the room. Uh, so let's go ahead and stand together, and we're going to recount the story of God together by going back and forth, and you have a line. Your line is, from the Psalms, his love endures forever, okay? So let's say that together. His love endures forever. And as we go through this, I would love for us to get more and more enthusiastic, energetic, lively with that, with that proclamation as we remember the story of God this morning. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. He made men and women in his image to show the world his glory. His love endures forever. Even when we fell into sin and evil and rebellion and death, his love endures forever. So Jesus came to bring us back to the Father because his love endures forever. Jesus lived a perfect life of obedient joy for us. His love endures forever. Jesus then died for us, defeating the powers of death, and rose again to show us how His love endures forever. The Spirit is being poured out into God's people because His love endures forever. And finally this morning, He is with us as we worship. His love endures forever. Let's sing it together.
sing, Lord, I need you. Father, thank you that you have given us all good things in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that when we look at Jesus, we see the heart of yourself, a heart breaking for the brokenness of creation, a heart that is humble and lowly in spirit, coming to us to rescue us from ourselves. Lord, we, we recognize this morning that when we come to you, we don't really bring anything except for our need, but that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love for your people. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you have died for us, and thank you, Lord, that you are powerful so much that you have risen from death and brought us with you into new life. We pray for our hearts, we pray for our minds, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds this morning so that we would know what is good and perfect and pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats together. Well, good morning. So this week we had uh, three uh, backyard Bible clubs, so three, three VBSs, various places around our community, uh, since we don't have our own church building, then we can't do a traditional VBS, but I, I was able to go to all three of them, and, and I would actually say when all three were done, I, I felt like I would rather do it that way than the traditional way. I mean, it was so well done in neighborhoods, and, and we got to meet the parents, and we got to meet the kids, and everybody knew everybody, and so I think it was really effective, and, but I did wonder kind of, so what do the neighbors think? Right? You got all these kids running around, singing, playing games, you know, being loud. And, and so I have an answer to that. Um, uh, Christina sent us uh, what their neighbor said about it, who never even came to it. But uh, she had written a text to Caleb, and she said this, Caleb, I meant to text this to you yesterday and forgot. Please thank your campers for their beautiful singing. The past couple of days, I've been in so much pain, and especially yesterday, I was lying down in bed, having a tough time falling asleep, and the sound of their voices lulled me to sleep. I really love listening to them. Thank you from me to all of them. I'm already looking forward to next year's camp, although I'm sure you're ready to sleep for about a week by now. <laughs> what a great testimony that is. And so I, I wanted to just recognize by asking some people to stand who were involved uh, in that this week. And so um, I, don't, I didn't know this until the end of the week, but there was a prayer team every night committed to praying for the Vacation Bible Schools going on. If you were part of that prayer team, would you stand up? That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not, but on, on the third Sunday of every month, there's actually a team that starts at 8.30 on Sunday morning uh, and goes all the way through 11.30. And so about 15-minute slots where they pray for this service uh, third Sunday. We're hoping to eventually make that every Sunday that happens, but this just happens to be the third Sunday. Um, if you were a leader or a host in these camps, would you please stand so we can recognize you?
And I know a number of folks had to leave town like yesterday, so when, when VBS was over. Um, how about the kids who are involved? You guys stand up, all the kids who are in VBS this week. That's great. And, and for us, the, the, the staff team, this has typically been something that we've had to kind of coordinate and organize. And, and, and I'll say it, it was not nearly as good as this year was. Okay? It wasn't bad, right? It's hard to go bad when you sing songs and eat sugar and talk about the Bible, right? <laughs> um, but, but this year, Wendy Dixon led things for us. And while every place was just so well done. Wendy, would you stand so we can just recognize and thank you for that. I, I just, the workload that she took off of us has been, was just huge. And so, so grateful. Um, this, this Saturday at uh, uh, six o'clock, uh, we will have our, our monthly prayer meeting together. If you've never been to that, then I would encourage you to come. We, we pray for an hour together. We kind of update on different things going on in the church so we can pray more specifically. Um, you guys get to share kind of what's going on with you as well. Uh, but we meet in the prayer room at 6 o'clock on Saturday. would love for you to join us for that. And, uh, and I was looking around last week, and I just wanted to rec- recognize this because I think it's a rarity. It's even been a rarity in our church in some ways, but... Um, when, we, when we get out of here, when, we, you know, when I say amen, Josh finishes the, the singing, then what ends up happening is we end up having to rush to get everything taken down because the Y opens at noon. So it's typically been a lot of work. And, and, and I noticed last week, and actually the last few weeks, how many young men are, are, are uh, dollying chairs. And, and I don't think anybody just said, you guys do this. But these young men have taken it on themselves, and they just, they grab dollies and they go. And, and I just want to tell you guys, like, we so appreciate that. It's one of the hardest things that we have to do is, is getting this stuff cleaned up and out of here. And, and everybody lends a hand to some level. But I've just noticed over the last few weeks, uh, these young men that are really taking it on themselves uh, to be a big part of that. And so I'm grateful for you guys. I wanted to tell you that publicly. Um, and, uh, and so we normally don't do this for our announcement time. It's a normal week other than that, okay? Normal week, summer week, the way we do things. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, you're in for a real treat. We get to have some of the kids up for uh, singing one of their VBS songs, and so uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I think Marsha's put together a video as well. But uh, if you're visiting with us, there should be a visitor's card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you would fill that out, and then after the service, you can give it to me, or you can put it in our tithe and offering box there in the back. Either is fine. Um, but let's take a few minutes. Let's greet one another. And the kids who are going to be singing, if you guys would come up, that would be great.
All right, everyone, if you want to come to your seats, I'd hate for you to miss out on these students. We had about 30 to 35 students at all the three houses combined, and then a bunch of them went on vacation. All right, you guys ready? This is our theme song. I want to give a shout out to all the music teachers, of which I was simply one, Hannah and Caitlin, Kaylee's gone on vacation, Conley, where's Conley? Come on, Conley, you got to help us this morning. All right, here we go.
It's pretty cool, isn't it? Thank you, Joe. Let's, uh, let's pray together. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. To them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Our Father, thank you for this wonderful week to impact the lives of 35 or so children and and even their parents, to be able to speak with them as well. What a privilege it is uh, to bring the law of the Lord to the children of the Lord. And so, God, as we thank you for that, we, we also ask you, help us to better understand your word. Help us to better know your son. Help those who don't yet know you to today come into a relationship with you. Use your word, equip your church, and bring the gospel to the lost. We pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, we'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter four. Matthew four. We are working through the book of, the, of Matthew, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and uh, somebody told me the other day, I bet you're going to slow down a bit when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, and I think the way we've got the Sermon on the Mount calculated, which is three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is it'll probably take anywhere from about 24 to 26 weeks just to get through those three chapters. So we're going to slow down pretty drastically. Uh, but today we've got uh, a few verses to work through, 11 verses, um, beginning Matthew 4, 1. And we've seen in these early chapters in the book of Matthew that Matthew has a purpose for writing this gospel, and his purpose is to present Jesus Christ as the King of Kings. And so it's no, no wonder why when he opens uh, his gospel and in the very first verse of this book, he identifies Jesus as the son of King David, the son of Abraham. And by the time the chapter ends, the first chapter ends, he is Emmanuel, Quite literally, he is God with us. You get to chapter, chapter 2, and there's some Gentile magi, and they seek Jesus, and, and they say, we're looking for the king of the Jews. And then when they find him, they worship him as God. And so in chapter 3, when John the Baptist baptizes him, then at that very moment, God the Father identifies him. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it shouldn't surprise you at all that immediately after Jesus is baptized, this battle with Satan begins. And I know so many of you guys have been through that. You, you get saved, you get baptized, and then the spiritual attack from Satan starts. It should be no surprise to you that that happens. Even for, for Christians who uh, maybe spend a long time with the Lord and just kind of have, have backslidden a bit and and, and they say, you know, I'm, I'm going to commit my way to the Lord. I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. I'm going to uh, encourage the church. I'm going to be a part of a ministry. I'm going to start serving the Lord. I'm going to 
uh, treat my wife different or my husband different. I'm going to uh, treat my kids different. And, and I'm committed to doing that. And as soon as that starts, you know what happened? Satan hits. I mean, you can count on it. You've now become his enemy, and he is going to attack you, and it shouldn't surprise you at all. He's the ruler of this world. He, he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the, he's the ruler of darkness. He's the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. I mean, he tried to destroy Jesus, tried to destroy the Messianic line before the Messianic line began. And then once Jesus was born, he sought to kill all the babies hoping that one of those babies would be Jesus. And what we're going to see today is that this is a full frontal attack that Satan makes as Jesus begins his final preparations to begin his ministry. And part of Jesus proving himself as king is he's got to prove himself that he has power over the king of this world, Satan. And at the heart of all of this, what's the point Matthew is making? Jesus is the qualified, worthy Messiah. And what we're going to see in, this, in these temptations are some really practical and really personal lessons that we can learn about what it looks like when we get tempted. And so this is a, a, a very impactful sermon. This is a very practical sermon as we look at um, what happened with Jesus. And so I'm going to read our whole text. It's 11 verses uh, beginning in 4.1, and then we're going to go back, and we're just going to kind of work through these verses one at a time. So Matthew 4, I hope you found it, beginning in verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Isn't that funny? He then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, and command the, that these stones become bread... But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not, stri they will, you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So at the outset, I just want to clear up a couple things, and I think at some point we'll probably say this, but uh, just on the, on the nature of temptation, first, uh, to be tempted is not sin, okay? Just because something tempts you does not make it sinful. What you do with it determines whether it's sin or not. But if temptation uh, were sin, then Jesus sinned, okay? Secondly, temptation is not from God. James 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, now the writer to the Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, but without sin. And so there's some important truths that we need to find out here about who Jesus is, about what temptation is, about how to fight temptation, how to know the difference between a temptation and a test. And we're going to find it in these 11 verses in Matthew 4. And so if you're taking notes this morning, point number one is simply the preparation. The preparation. Satan, and this isn't a surprise to anybody, Satan is the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. And this fight that he has with Jesus is going to continue until Satan is cast into the lake of fire, which is a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And he will eventually stay there forever and ever. At the cross, Satan became a forever defeated foe of Jesus. And so Satan's battle now is against those who were made in the image of God. His battle is against us. Satan's hatred for Jesus is in trying to get us. And so he is going to attack on every little thing that he can imagine. 
and how Jesus responded to these temptations is going to help us to be prepared when we're tempted. And so let's look first at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, now there's some theological things in here that you go, wait a second, what does this mean? The Holy Spirit led Jesus, uh, was led, or sorry, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Like he's, he's putting him there in, in, in harm's way? Did the Holy Spirit want this to happen to him? Did he, was his goal was, let's see if he's going to sin or not? I don't think so. I think that the Holy Spirit's role here is, to, is, is proving Christ's holiness. He's proving his power over Satan. So the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Why? What's it say? To be tempted by the devil, which is kind of wild, right? We just read that God does not tempt anyone. So if God does not tempt anyone, yet God the Spirit leads God the Son into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, it almost sounds like a contradiction. It's kind of wild, right? And so to understand this, we really need to understand both the negative and the positive connotations behind the word tempt. Did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted to do evil? Was that the Spirit's goal? Was it his desire for the son to sin? Well, of course not. But tempt doesn't always carry a negative connotation to it. In fact, in both the Hebrew and the Greek, to tempt also means to test or, or to prove the value or the quality of something. I used to work in a dental lab, and I've shared this example a few times. I kind of miss doing it, but we would take uh, gold to make a gold tooth, and, and when you see the gold, it's just kind of... Um, it, it can be an old gold tooth that you use, right? It could be a, a nice shiny piece of gold. And, and, and you take these things, you measure them out, and you need X amount of gold for, for this type of crown. And, and so you take this gold and you put it into a crucible. And, and when, you, when you take the torch and you put the flame on there, and eventually it heats up. And, and as it heats up, it's all these individual pieces. Suddenly they just, they come together around the heat and they form into this bubble, and it's just up there shaking. And you look through these glasses and you go, oh, there's, there's some uh, um, uh, discrepancies in it. And you take, some, you take some flux and you just pour a little flux in there, just a, a, a sprinkle like salt. And then the, then the in, um, disparities, they, they, they go away. And all you're left with is this beautiful, shiny, bubbling piece of gold. It, it doesn't destroy the gold. The gold is refined by the, by the heat. I, one of my favorite sayings is, true gold fears no fire because it's not destroyed by it. It's refined by it. Abraham was tested. Prove his worthiness when he was called to sacrifice his son Isaac. Job, when he went through all the things that he went through, that was test. God was proving to Satan. Remember Job 1 and Job 2. Have you considered my servant Job? Right? You can tempt him because I know that this test will prove who he is. He's pure gold. And remember, these early chapters of Matthew, what are they doing? They're, they're proving Jesus is the qualified king. And so in every trial, I think there's both test and temptation. Right? Obviously, the devil's desire is for Jesus to sin. The Holy Spirit knows he won't. He knows that these tests are going to prove him as king. And so the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to show and to prove that Jesus was the obedient Son of God. It was proving that he would follow Jesus whatever path the Father would lay out for him. And where does he lead him to? The wilderness. The wilderness. We see this word all the time, and I thought, what, what does it mean? The wilderness, if you translate it directly, it would be a place without inhabitants. It's an empty place. It's an abandoned place. It can mean a place of waste. It's a lonely place. The, the, the wilderness is, is where the demoniac wandered in Luke 8. The wilderness is, is, is full of, of, of rocky and jagged cliffs. 
The wilderness is also the place where Jesus went and when he wanted to escape the crowds or to find a quiet place for his disciples. The wilderness was a place of stillness. In this particular instance, the wilderness is where there was no help for Jesus. Mark adds a little insight, and he says that, that Jesus was with the wild beast in the wilderness. In Africa, the, the Colosili, Pastor Colosili, he, he'll often say, you know, well, bring, bring somebody else with you next time and remind them Africa is not a place for sissies. The wilderness was no place for sissies. The wilderness, you needed to be hardened. You needed to be ready. You needed to be tough. It was not for the soft and the weak. And that's exactly where the Spirit led the Son. Verse 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Then he became hungry. Isn't that funny? There's a parallel account to this in in the book of Luke. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. So they, they, they both admit that it was like day 41 when he became hungry. And so Luke adds a little bit of detail here. And, and in Luke, it, it tells us that it wasn't the 41st day that, that Jesus was tempted. Because that's kind of how Matthew reads, right? Almost reads as if on the 40, you know, he, then he became hungry, then Satan came, uh, and then the temptations happened. But Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke and, and in Mark, it seems to read that he was tempted for 40 days. So it's 40 days of temptations. It seems to me, the, the way this reads, and most commentators agree with this, is that the three temptations we're going to see today, these are the final temptations. These are the culmination of the temptations. These are probably the most difficult of the ter- temptations. But it's been 40 days of temptation. Imagine that, 40 days of temptation, 40 days of trials, 40 days of these tests, and you're in the wilderness, and you haven't eaten for 40 days. And so Jesus is weak, and he's weary, and he's hungry, and he's lonely, and he's vulnerable. He is primed for attack. Well, when he's primed for attack, what do you think happens next? Verse 3, just the first part, and the tempter came. And the tempter came. You know the tempter. The devil came. The evil one came. Lucifer came. The dragon came. The serpent came. That's who shows up. Now listen, I, I, think, I think Satan gets a lot more credit than he deserves. He's not omnipresent. He can't be at all places at all times. Now I know he has evil forces and principalities, but he can't read our minds. He's not omniscient. He can't force us to do anything, right? He's not uh, omnipotent. In fact, what Scripture teaches is that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. But I say all that saying that he is a formidable foe. And so point number two is the temptations. When Satan comes to Jesus in today's text, he's going to come as we, in, in three waves of temptation But understand, these aren't the first temptations. I think they're more like the final. Verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. You know, Satan begins his temptation with the word if. If. It's an important word. Remember, he's the great deceiver, right? He's the one that's, that's always planting doubt. Sometimes his greatest victory over us is when he's able to create a little bit of doubt in our mind. Especially if he can create doubt about who God is, about what God has done, about what God thinks about you, about what you've done. You see, if he can get you to doubt God's love and to doubt God's goodness and doubt God's care for you and doubt God's uh, longing to forgive you, if he can get you to doubt your conversion, and doubt your ability and power that he's given you to overcome sin through his spirit, you know what? He wins. He wins. Just by planting a seed of doubt, and the first seed of doubt is the word if. 
He knew Jesus was the Son of God. I have no doubt in my mind that he was there a few verses earlier at Jesus' baptism when the Father identified him. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And yet Satan is an expert of planting seeds of doubt. But, but this if is not a question of doubt. The if is, is what they call in English a first-class conditional clause. You can take that word if and put since. Since you are the Son of God. Now, since you are the Son of God, if you were the Son of God, would turning stones into bread be genuine temptation? Yeah, for him. I've never been tempted to turn stones into bread. Why? Because I can't do it. No matter how much I try, no matter what I say, like I don't have that ability. So that's not a temptation for me, but certainly that would have been temptation for him. He's hungry. He has the ability to satisfy his hungry hunger by simply making his own bread. Would that have been sin? Well, I don't know. Doing miracles related to food isn't sin. Feeding hungry people miraculously, that's not sin. He fed fed thousands with just a few fish and a couple loaves of bread. I mean, he, he fed manna to the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. That was supernatural. So the the sin would not have been the miracle of turning stones into bread. You know what the sin was? Doubting God's word. We get that from Jesus' answer in verse 4. Look at it. But he answered him and said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's hungry. He can relieve the hunger pains by simply turning the stones into bread. So what if we did this? What if we just, let's reword Satan's temptation. We'll add a little bit to it. So he comes to the son and he says, didn't God just say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? If that's true, why wouldn't the father give you food? Would he really rather you starve in the wilderness? I mean, what in the world would that accomplish? Was God lying when he called you his beloved son? I mean, of all the people in the world, why should you be hungry? That's beneath you to be hungry. You fed, you fed manna to unbelieving Jews in the wilderness for 40 years. But now he's forsaken you. The one he calls his son. Look at you. Look how hungry you are. If God cares for you like you think he cares for you, then why are you here? Jesus, it's your turn to get fed. You deserve it. It's been 40 days. Turn these stones into bread. You see, the the point of the temptation is not to feed his hunger. The point of the temptation is for Jesus to distrust his father. And you know what Satan uses to do that? He uses his hunger to do it. He thinks Jesus is going to get hangry. And, And part of this preparation for temptation is that Jesus knew scripture. Verse four is is a direct quote from Deuteronomy three. I asked my Sunday school class this morning, how well would you do to resist temptation if you had the quote from the book of Deuteronomy? Okay, Deuteronomy three or Deuteronomy six, how well would you do? Contextually, this is from Deuteronomy 3, and and Deuteronomy 3, within its context, is is a reminder uh, that God gives to his people that he's going to care for them during their wilderness wanderings. It's the perfect verse. It's a reminder, don't don't grab your own satisfaction, but trust God. And here's Satan trying to convince Jesus that if he doesn't turn these stones into bread, then he's going to die. You know what Jesus knows? It's not the bread that keeps him alive. It's not the bread. God is the source of his strength. If God wants to keep him alive, he doesn't need bread to do it. Because man does not live on bread alone. What's he live on? What's he say? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus knows for sure that the Father will not fail him and he will not forsake him. He knows that God is going to feed him in his time. And until then, he knows that he can trust him. 
And so this first temptation, it's, it's really an opportunity for, for Jesus to misuse his supernatural power. And he can misuse his supernatural power if he would just distrust God's word. If he would just not trust that God is going to be faithful to care for him. If he would just go away from what he knows to be true and just for this little moment, just turn stones into bread. And when he won't do it, the next thing you read, temptation's over, they're moved from the wilderness into the holy city of Jerusalem. Look at verse five. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Now the pinnacle of the temple is, is the corner that, that overlooks the Kidron Valley. It's about 450 feet high. Tradition tells us that this is where James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, was thrown off of, and that's where he died. So the idea is, well, okay, Jesus, you, you say you trust God, right? You say you can trust him no matter what. Well, if you're not going to prove yourself by, by working a miracle to feed yourself, then why not do something that's going to prove, uh, that's going to force God to prove himself to you? I mean, if you trust him, then let him save you. And you know where Satan goes to in order to try to convince him of this? Scripture. He goes straight to Scripture. Verse 6. And said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. It's Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. If... Since you are the son of God, then the angels will protect the Messiah. The angels are responsible. God will make sure that his angels save you. I mean, listen, Jesus, if you say you trust the Father, then why not let the Father prove himself trustworthy? I mean, if you really say you trust him, then put his trust to the test. So the first temptation was to do a miracle and go against God's will, but this temptation is different. This is the sin of testing God. This is the sin of manipulating God. The first temptation, it was, it was accompanied by real hunger. And here, Jesus is tempted to create a need, to presume on God to deliver, to deliver him from it. We read Psalm 19, verse 13 in our pastoral prayer. I don't know if you caught it. It says, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. It's the stuff we get into And we just presume that God's going to rescue us. You've been there before, right? You know it's wrong. You know you're not supposed to. But we just read earlier, right? Love endures forever. Forever and ever. And so we just go, well, I mean, if we do this, he's going to forgive me anyway. I know I'm going to keep messing up, but he's just going to forgive me anyway. Look at verse 7. Look how Jesus responds. responds. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6. Now let's just imagine for a minute. Let's say he does it. In other words, let's say he takes the the jump. 450 feet up, overlooking the Kidron Valley. He, He jumps off, does a little swan dive. 450 feet later, he's landing softly in front of all the people. And what's he say? Now do you believe I'm the Messiah? It's got to be pretty convincing, right? I mean, if if you just swan dive from 450 and you're down and and it says that you won't let your your feet like hit the rocks. And and so you're down, you're flying down and then all of a sudden, just lands. I mean, that would be convincing, right? John MacArthur says that there were some false messiahs that tried this. He gave some examples of them. I like his concluding response. He says, there are some false messiahs that tried this. They had brief careers. (laughs) People constantly asked Jesus to show them a sign, but he wouldn't do it. Why? I mean, why not prove who you are to everyone watching by just jumping off this building and God saving you. I mean, honestly, this, this, this jump would have given him instant fame. He would have had instant popularity, so why didn't he jump? 
He didn't jump because he didn't come to be popular. He came to be rejected. He came to be hated. He came to be despised. He came to be killed. He came as a suffering servant to die. And so if he jumps off and then he's crowned king, then what he happens is he bypasses the cross and he bypasses the payment for sin. Isaiah 53, 5, he says, but he was, let me just change this a little bit, but he had to be pierced through for our transgressions. He had to be crushed for our iniquities. He had to be chastened for our well-being. He had to be scourged for our healing. And we could just keep going. He had to be oppressed. He had to be afflicted. He had to be a lamb led to slaughter. He had to be despised. He had to be forsaken of men. He had to be cut off from the land of the living. Isaiah it then goes on and says, it pleased the Lord to crush him, putting him to grief. Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus did not come to be famous. He came to be forsaken. And had he could succumb to this temptation, his followers would go everywhere with him waiting for the next jump, waiting for the next miracle. They would have followed because they loved the show, but they would not have followed because they loved God. They would have loved the miracles, but they wouldn't have hated the message. And Jesus would go on to tell this group that it is a wicked, adulterous, perverse generation that seeks for signs and miracles. And those who seek the miraculous will typically desire power and popularity, and they will not desire repentance and faith. And so in John 6, the, the crowds followed Jesus because they, they saw all the signs that he performed on the sick. And then they got hungry, and so Jesus feeds 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. Next thing you know, Jesus disappears and there's some walking on water and things like that that happen in between. But, they, but he goes across the Sea of Galilee and they find him. Remember what he said to them? John 6, verse 26. Truly, I truly, I say to you, you seek me, not me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You know what he's saying? You don't want me. You're not here to repent and follow me. You're here because you like my cooking. You're here because you think because of what you think you can get from me, but you're not here for me. And listen, that happens all the time in the church. Some of the most committed people in the church are those who are trying to bargain with God. Those who are presuming on God. They get a problem, the next thing you know, man, they're in your Bible every day. They're, they're, they're coming to, to men's group or women's groups. They're in church all the time. They're volunteering to serve because, because in their minds, they're thinking, if I don't do this, then, then Jesus is going to get me. But if I do these things, and he's, he's, I've kind of kept him down, right? I've, I've delayed his wrath, and so I just got to keep doing these things, which is the case of wanting the blessing of Jesus, but not actually wanting Jesus. And what happens is when the problem doesn't get fixed the way that you want them to be fixed, then what? Yeah, this Christianity thing doesn't work. Jesus had thousands of people who followed him. How many were there when he died? Three. One was his mom. She had to be there. And I think the vast majority of them came to Jesus for all the wrong reasons. John 6, verse 66, it says, as a result of this, the this there is teaching about the hardship of discipleship. It says many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? God, I've given up everything. To whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Jesus did not come to entertain thrill seekers. He came for repentant sinners. There's, there's no room for sensationalism for the one who came to suffer. Satan's not done yet. Look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. This is a desperate devil. We don't know which mountaintop he takes him to. We do know it's high enough for, 
to be able to see all the kingdoms of the world. By the way, Satan's the prince of this world, right? Those are his kingdoms, still are, for now. And he's willing to give Jesus Egypt and Rome and Greece and all the nations of the world. Just, just one caveat to that, if, if you will just worship me. Is this a temptation? Yes, it's a temptation. Because in the end, all these kingdoms belong to Jesus. Satan is offering to give Jesus now what God is going to give to Jesus later. So what's the temptation? You don't have to go through the cross to get your inheritance. You can have all your inheritance without any of the suffering. You can be the king and you don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to withstand the full wrath of God. All you have to do, just bow down and worship me. Listen, that's the message we hear all the time. You deserve it. Just a little compromise. God won't mind. You don't have to go through what's hard. You have a right to be happy. You don't have to wait. All you got to do is worship me. All sin is an act of worship. God says, thou shalt not. Satan says, take and eat. Every time we sin, we bow our knee to Satan. It's really an issue of worship. We worship God when we trust his word. We worship God when we do his will. We worship God when we don't do our own will. We worship God when we stop worrying and know and believe and trust that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus wins as expected. Verse three, I'm sorry, not verse three, number three, point three, the triumph. For Jesus to have bowed to Satan would be for Jesus to become the Antichrist. He would have become the Satan's world ruler. He would have become the beast. And so look how he responds in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and behold, and angels came and began to minister to him. Go Satan, that was a command, it wasn't a suggestion. By the way, it's from Deuteronomy 6, this verse. And when Jesus tells Satan to leave, you know what he does? He leaves. Because Satan knows who the Lord is. I think it's Vodi Bauckham who said, we got all these people binding up Satan every week in church in the name of Jesus. Then he said, who keeps letting him go? <laughs> Satan left. Why? He had to. He had no choice. The, the God-man, Jesus, he passed the test. He proved his true identity as Messiah, and he proved his power as God in the flesh. And we don't know specific ways that the angels ministered to him. My guess is they, they brought him food and drink. They allowed him to rest, and they strengthened him. And I think there's an important point here. When Jesus passed these tests, he didn't become worthy of being Messiah. When Jesus passed these tests, he proved that he was worthy as the Messiah. And so how do we apply this? Well, there are so many things. I, I told Josh, I said, I've got five points of, of, uh, of application, and somehow I'm going to try to get them down to three. And so here's the three that I came up with. Number one, understand the nature of temptation. Understand the nature of temptation. What you see in, in this, these temptations is really the same pattern you see throughout the scriptures and even in our own lives. 1 John 2, verse 15, look what it says. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And so these are the temptations that Jesus went through here. That's why it can say that Jesus was tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. The first temptation is the lust of the flesh. It's a temptation to feel. It's physical. It can be sexual sin. It can be some kind of eating disorder. It can be drug addiction. You're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. Satisfy your flesh. 
What does Jesus respond? John 4, verse 34, he says, my food. Like, why was he not hungry until 40 day, day 40 or day 41? Why, why then? John 4 says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so the temptation, the first temptation was a temptation to desire uh, or desire to feel. It was the lust of the flesh. The second is the lust of the eyes. It's the, it's the temptation to, to have. It's coveting. It's a desire to have something that doesn't belong to you. It's, it's a fantasy world. By the way, that's why Jesus upgraded the sin of adultery from the physical act to the looking with lust act. And then there's the pride of life. The pride of life is the desire to be. You want power. You want recognition. You want personal glory. You want social status. You want education. And the pride of life is the opposite of humility. And so turn these stones into bread, the lust of the flesh. All these kingdoms can be yours, the lust of the eyes. Force God to save you, the pride of life. We really see the same thing in the Garden of Eden, right? Genesis 3, look at it, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, oh, that looks good, lust of the flesh. It was a delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. She took from its fruit and ate. And so in both Genesis, I'm sorry, yeah, in both Genesis and in the wilderness, what's the temptation? To eat. In both Genesis and in the wilderness, the temptation was to be like God by disobeying God. But Adam's behavior in the garden meant that the angels were barred, from, barred him from coming back. Whereas in the wilderness, the second Adam did not sin and the angels came and ministered to him. You see, in understanding the nature of temptation, we also need to understand point number two, my inclination to temptation. Understand my inclination to temptation. The first two temptations Jesus faced are not anything that would tempt us, right? We're not tempted to turn stones into bread. We might wish we could, but it's not a true temptation. We're not tempted to jump off a cliff knowing that God's gonna rescue us. So what's the temptation there for us? We're tempted to doubt, to doubt God's word. We're tempted to presume on God's goodness. We're tempted to satisfy our sinful desires. We're tempted to worship Satan. It's all part of the, 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 the battle between our sin nature and our new nature. We're all tempted in many ways. And, and listen, Satan knows your weak areas. Satan knows the areas where you're vulnerable. And, and he has a plan to expose you to your vulnerabilities. He, he uses the same tactics on you that he's used since the garden. The lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of your life. So what do you do? I should have put 1 John back on there, but the beginning of 1 John, what it says is, do not love the world. Do not love the world. That's the ultimate way that we find victory. Well, what does that look like? James 4, verse 7, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I think what we do most of the time, we think if we just resist the devil, then he flees. But it's two parts. We submit to God first. Then we resist the devil. I mean, that's what Jesus did. We get a model of that. How did he submit to God? He spent voracious time in Scripture so he had answers when tempted. I really encouraged my Sunday school class today, memorize scripture, memorize scripture, memorize scripture. Keep memorizing scripture. Psalm 119 verse 11, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. We, we won't give in to temptation if we submit to God and resist the devil. You cannot make selfish and sinful decisions and just presume that God's going to bail you out. Last week in, we, in our men's group, we studied the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk starts off and, and, and he's asking God, like, God, how come all this wickedness is going on around, around your people and, and you're not doing anything about it? Like, God, how can you let your people sin and just stand there and not do anything about it? And God says, you know what, Habakkuk, I actually am doing something about it. 
but if I told you what I was going to do, it would absolutely blow your mind. So I'm not going to tell you. Okay, I'll tell you. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans or the, the Babylonians, these fierce group of people to take you, to take my people into captivity. I'm going to basically allow them to destroy you because of your sin. And Habakkuk's like, whoa, 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 hold, hold on a second. You can't do that. They're more evil than we are. What's Habakkuk doing? He's presuming on what God is supposed to do. But God's ways aren't our ways. God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. He's God. We are not. Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. We cannot go against the known will of God and presume on his actions. So we have to understand the, temp the nature of temptation we also have to understand our own inclination to temptation. And then point number three, we have to understand the road to blessing. There are no shortcuts on the road to God's blessings. Satan is going to continually come to you and he's going to tempt you with the idea that the end justifies the means. And he has a specific plan for you. And his suggestion is that the way to be truly happy is to compromise. Just a little bit, I love the saying, a little, a little compromise now and then make big fools of little men. Jesus had the choice, and he had the choice between taking the easy path to blessing or the hard one. He chose the hard one. We have the same choice. We can deny ourselves and consider others as more important than ourselves, or we can take the easy way. Our loyalty is either to the cross or it's to fulfill our own selfish desires. And the Christian life is not the easy life. The Christian life is the narrow road. It's the rough road, but it's the road to blessing. I just want to close. I'm just going to read one verse that's familiar to you, but where we see both God's role and our role in victory over temptation in one verse. It's just a summary 1 Corinthians 10, 13, look what he says. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape. And I would add in there the godly way of escape so that you might endure it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what a gift you've given us in your word. And what an example you've given us in your son. Thank you for the one who had never sinned and be died on behalf of our sins. Thank you for him who took our sin and our punishment on himself and then exchanged that for his own righteousness. Thank you that it's by grace that we are saved through faith. That it's not of ourselves, it's not anything that we can do. But it's only through him so that nobody can boast or brag about it. Father, I thank you for a salvation so freely given to us that costs your son so much. I pray for those in here this morning who have never bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus. I pray they would have the faith to believe that there is one who left heaven, who became a man, who lived the perfect life that none of us could live and who died the death that we all deserve. Thank you for the one that exchanges his righteousness for our sin. Thank you that you make it so simple for us that everyone who would believe in him has eternal life. What a blessing, we pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, let's stand. We're gonna sing a couple songs as we close our service this morning. This is one of our favorites, an old spiritual, as we think about our whole lives as being lived in the wilderness, where we are constantly coming into contact with what Jesus experienced. He is very familiar with that. Oh, what a savior we have. He walks with us in the wilderness. I want Jesus to walk with me. 
want Jesus to walk with me all along my pilgrim journey. Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. Let's sing together. In temptation, Lord, walk with me.
As we close our time this morning, I've just been thinking about a couple years ago, I, I memorized the opening of the book of Hebrews. And in chapters three and four, the author is making this comparison to the people in Israel, the Israelites, in the wilderness, being the paradigm for what it is to be a follower of God. And he's saying that there still remains a promised land for the people of God. Let us therefore strive not to fall in the wilderness and be disobedient in the wilderness as the people of uh, Israel were. And of course, we see this in Jesus. But I love this, this line in Hebrews 3. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another so that no one would be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If you have felt conviction this morning about your sin, there is good news. You are not alone. I am, I am in that. And I just want to invite you, if you have uh, things to, to discuss, things to talk about, things to confess, uh, we are here for you as a church. Con exhort one another every day. That's our job. That's our mission. So if you're feeling that conviction, don't hold it in. There are so many people around you who would love to be the voice of Jesus, offering you and reminding you of your forgiveness in Christ. As we go, let's remember Jesus' words from the end of the book of Matthew. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace.